Hey there, welcome back to Farmcraft. Lots of you know I lost my mind and bought a dozer recently. Done a lot of work on it so far, um, but today we're gonna address the hydraulics. Several things that I need to fix here. Let me show you. This cylinder right here, this is one of the lift cylinders, lifts the blade up. It's the worst one because it needs a new rod. The chrome is gone. It's leaking like crazy. Look how much oil there is on that rod. There's a constant puddle of oil underneath it. So that rod needs replaced, the cylinder needs repacked. The hydraulic oil filter is there. I need to take that off, change that, and we'll drain the hydraulic oil and refill that. And then the lift cylinder on the other side. Uh, it looks like the rod might be okay, but the seals have gone and it's leaking as well. We fixed this fitting in video number one and it's doing fine, not leaking anymore. And the rest of the cylinders on here are good. Yeah, we got two cylinders to pack, one rod to replace, hydraulic oil to change. Let's get to it. Not a very impressive drain for the hydraulic tank. It's just a petcock that uh, looks like it's lost the handle, just like the other side did. And it's supposed to dribble out through this little hose. I guess that's a metal hose. Well, I'll see if I can get that to open. A pair of vice grips, I guess. The other end of that hose is right here, so I can take it down into this and then down into my drain pan. Yeah, that thing's just barely dripping. So used to blowing out hoses when uh, when they're plugged. It's like, yeah, just uh, just take an air gun and blow in that thing. Well, what I'm gonna be doing then is blowing whatever junk is in that hose right into my hydraulic system. We do not want to do that. So I think what I might do is see if I can take the cap off and just blow a little air in there just to help try to blow it this way, blow it out. Clean trash bag and a blow gun here. still going to take a while. Well, fortunately, I don't have to have it drained to start working on the hydraulics. Um, changing the oil is just something that I wanted to do because it's a new dozer. I don't know how long that oil's been in there. Don't be fooled when oil looks good. The oil in my lift looked really good when I got it, and it's not something I ever caught on video, so I didn't show it in a video, but I was getting intermittent cavitation at times when I was using it which is really bad for hydraulic pumps. I was trying to figure out what was going on, and when I changed the oil, it never did it again. So the oil looked good, you know, it was nice and slick, it, it didn't have water in it, everything looked fine, but that oil was old and it was not doing its job anymore. So you gotta know how old the oil is. And here's our first victim. You know, one thing that really surprises me about this machine is the lack of grease fittings. So on the back side of this thing, there is a, a set screw. I certainly can't see it, but there it is. Hopefully after I get that out of there, Getting this gland off won't be that big of a deal. You may recall the last time I was fighting to get a gland off, it was a cylinder that was probably worth more than this bulldozer. Reef. I bought an Amazon special. So hopefully this is gonna make this one a little easier. I go this way on that. I thought I broke it at first. I guess I just didn't have it latched well enough. Okay, Man. Whew. 
need some eye protection on. I feel like that chain's gonna explode right in my face. This will do it. Wow. All right, we're gonna have to do some heat. I need to be hotter than that. Oh, come on. Can't believe that won't move. I mean, to this wrench's credit, I'm three feet out and I'm putting my whole body weight on it. 600 foot pounds. Won't move it. Nothing like the smell of sizzling seals. Ah, look at that. Why that one was so stubborn. Now this rod, I think I'm going to be keeping, so I don't want that gland nut just uh, scraping on it like that. <clears throat> well, that sure was easier than the other side. There it comes. There's the O-ring that seals it. Oh, crap. Forgot about this. That's nice. Oil all over my welding blanket. What a treat. What could go wrong there? An oily welding blanket. I can't think of a thing. If I try to pull that out like it is, I'm going to be fighting negative pressure, basically making a vacuum. So I'm going to crack this line to let some air go in there. So I'm going to try to use compressed air, but I don't want to launch this thing. Air, you know, is a big spring. It can uh, build up some pressure and do some unexpected things sometimes. So Looks good.
backup ring disintegrating. Yeah, there's not much this thing doesn't take off, but that's one of them. You know what? That really stinks. Why do it that way? Why not just put a nut there? Because now I have to thread that. I do not have a tap for that. Looks like we're going to be doing some single point threading. All right, let's see if I got the right seal kit. Hmm, <laughs> definitely not. That's a bummer. Well, that means a trip to the hydraulic shop. Boy, that came out awful easy. So those are the gland seals. Now the piston, this is kind of interesting. This wear band, wear bands oftentimes you can just pull off very easily. And the purpose of this is to, the cylinder's laying on its side, and the seal itself, which is this, is not good at taking that lateral force. So this takes the lateral force and takes the pressure off of this. This will compress a little bit into it, but it won't sit there and get smashed. And what's unusual, I've never seen this before, this guy is split. You just separate it. Interesting. And then it looks like there's an O-ring underneath, which gives it some preload. It pushes the seal against the barrel wall. Yeah, and it was on the gland here where there was a backup ring that disintegrated. So I need to take that other cylinder off and get the backup ring off of that to bring to the hydraulic shop. There we go. And now a screwdriver. Yeah, there's the backup ring that I'm after. <laughs> I can tell you that gland moves on that rod way too easy. <clears throat> Why is that thing so? Too much air leaking for the air pressure to push it out, but I can't pull it out by hand, so I'm gonna have to come along that or something. All right, here's the setup. Got the old pickup truck and the come along. 
And we're going to pull that thing out of there. Why is that thing so hard to come out? I mean, there must be something in the barrel there that's hanging on those seals, because the piston never comes up that far. All right, I'm gonna replace this stretchy rope with a piece of chain, which will make it less likely to launch. Great. What's going on here? Time to reevaluate. I mean, the barrel feels fine. Uh, this port right here, I don't feel any burr sticking out, but that's right where it was, so I have to think that's what it was. Otherwise, it all seems good. That port up there, I think, just kind of has a sharp edge, and the seal going by it is digging into that edge and just holding up. So I'm just going to reach up in there with a little round file and try to knock that edge off. Oh, I think it's coming. Well, I was trying not to hit that rod, but... Okay, <laughs> look at that gland. <laughs> That's a little too loose. Yeah, inside of that barrel looks perfect. See if this one's gonna fail me again. Vice off of there. All right, there's my backup ring. I don't know if you can see that side right there is concave, and then the other side of it is flat. O-ring goes towards the pressure, concave got side goes against the O-ring, and the purpose of the backup ring, I didn't understand this until I did a video on it recently and several people explained it, is to back up the O-ring. You gotta think of hydraulics as directional. The pressure's coming from one side and trying to get out. Well, without the backup ring there, this soft rubber could potentially get extruded right through the gap that exists between the two pieces of metal that you're sealing. So you need something behind it to help support it, but you also need the squishiness of the rubber to make the seal. So you combine the two properties, something that's strong, the backup ring, and something that's squishy, the O-ring. All right, I got several challenges that I'm not sure how it's gonna go. Um, one, 
these rods might be hardened and I have carbide tooling which should be able to handle it but I don't know it's probably not like top of the line carbide so we'll have to see how that goes. The ones I bought are definitely hardened, so same issue there. I'm going to need to do some turning on them. And then cutting this weld, it would be nice to have, they're called button inserts, and I don't have any. That's one thing. But the big thing is this. I was not expecting this to be a bolt. Typically, this is an external thread here. The piston would go on to a shoulder, and then thread would be sticking out, and you'd have a nut that you tighten down. I've never seen one like this. I don't know what the advantage is of doing it this way, but it definitely makes it, you know, maybe it's easier to machine if you have the tap. The threads go in quite far. I mean, they go into like there and that's only a one inch hole. So reaching in there with a threading tool and trying to thread that deep is gonna be a bit of a challenge. I cannot get that tap locally. I'd have to order it, I'd have to wait. Yeah, I could, but you know, eh, I've got a lathe. Let's see if we can make this happen. I've got this boring bar, which will allow me to reach in. It's pretty heavy. I can use it with one inch and it just takes high speed steel, uh, quarter inch square stock. And so I need to make a 60 degree threading tool. So I already put a little bit of layout die on that and scribed, this is just a 60 degree angle gauge and I've scribed my 60 degree mark. So I'm gonna take that over to the belt sander and we're gonna get it right on 60 degrees. All right, so there's the angle, that's good. Now it needs clearance underneath. I'll just take it on a diamond stone and hone it all down a little bit. little radius on the end. All right, 160 degree thread cutting tool. So first thing I need to do is take this eye off of here. So now I need to turn this weld down. I don't really have the best tool for it. I'm gonna start out with this and get as deep as I can and then I'm gonna to have to go to a parting tool and we'll see how it goes. So this is a brand new piece of induction hardened one and a half inch chrome rod. So now I need to make this into this. 
So this has this one inch hole and a chamfer, a little bit of a relief there, and then the threads, the dreaded threads. I have a plan. I'm going to thread away from the chuck, something I've never done before, but should make this a lot easier. Makes it less likely that you're going to crash, much less likely. You don't want to crash the lathe. Isn't that pretty? So this is my first attempt at turning this hardened steel and you can see where it's hard. It throws lots of sparks pretty hard on the carbide. Just shy of two and a half. That'll work. All right, now I'm just taking this one inch bit to cut that outer section. Eight eighty five, and I need nine thirty five. I'm at 895. I need 35, so I got 40 thousandths to go. Now I do want to bore this outer clearance off just a little bit more too, but that's not critical of the dimension. I'm just going to take a little bit off. Okay, now we need some chamfers. This is going to be my first time really trying to machine this hardened stuff. So I'm actually going to take one of my, this is probably going to fail, but I'm going to try. I have these things that are supposedly carbide, but they're garbage. I'm just going to sharpen this up on a diamond stone and then uh, see if I can get it just to give me a chamfer there. Oh, good grief. Tried to cut it for a second. Garbage. I'm just going to throw those things away. All right, I've got a carbide insert. The tip broke off of this, and I didn't throw the insert away just in case for something like this. This edge right here should still be good. So let's see if this carbide's up to the task. These are better quality. I pushed up a tiny little bit of a burr on the face there. I'm going to take that off. Now we're ready to thread this sucker. This is the fun part. So I'm just squaring up to the work. Using the face of the chuck to make sure I'm square. Alright, so there's our threading tool. I've got the lathe set up to do 14 threads per inch, which is what I need. So what I'm doing here, typically you thread towards you and you feed towards the chuck. 
So I'm reversing both things, which means the lathe's going to be spinning the opposite direction and I'm going to be feeding away from the chuck. So it still makes a right hand thread. There's nothing different, except there's nothing to crash into, <laughs> which is a big difference. That's really nice because you can't see much. It's a small hole. You know, when you're coming towards it and this is going to hit, if you don't stop in time, it makes it a lot harder. But right now, the cutting edge is aligned with the face. Yeah, that's good. So I now have a zero set, and that is where I'm going to start my thread. And I mean, I'll do my best to explain this. Internal threading is impossible to video. I can't see anything when I'm doing it, let alone filming it. But basically, I'm going to be making little tiny passes and coming out and cutting a thread. Uh, if you want to see more on threading, I've got a, a video. I'll put a link to it here um, where I threaded a real long bolt and kind of explained how the whole threading process works. So check that out if you want to learn more. So what I'm going to do first, I'm going to touch off and then I'm going to look at my depth and I'm going to plunge in what should be, I probably need to go like 80 thousandths to make a place for me to work out of. Then I'll come back to my zero, and that's just going to make a groove. The deepest portion of the thread will just have a groove going all the way around, because I'm not doing any feed while I do this. I'm just plunging. Touched. So there's my zero. That's 20, 30, 40. Why not 100? Okay, back to zero. The first one you can do a pretty heavy cut. I'm gonna go in 20. Off camera, I already confirmed that this thread is correct. So now I take the cross slide back to zero. That disengages me from that cut. I can advance all the way back in to my zero here. So now I'm at that groove that I cut. Now I can bring this back to zero. So now I'm exactly where I was when I just did my last cut. Let's advance this. I'll just do five. So cross slide out. So I've disengaged from the threads. I come in, and I'm going to go to this zero, so I get the carriage. Now I'm on that groove. I can bring this back to zero. So I'm right where I was when I did my last cut, and then I advance the compound that way. We'll do ten thousandths. That was a little bit of a heavy cut. I'll do fives from now on, I think. Zero. 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 Wow, it's close. Yeah, it's definitely going to need probably more than a spring pass, but not much more. I'd rather not overshoot, so I'm just going to do a spring pass. And what that means is there's spring on the, the bar sticking out. It bends down as it's cutting. And if you do the exact same measurements again, you're going to get another cut just because now there's less pressure on the tool that won't bend as much. So it'll be in the work a little bit more. So we're going to cut that exact same thing again. So one, zero. Zero. Second zero and then back to zero here. So right there is where I did my last cut. 
And we're just, we're not gonna change anything. I'm not gonna dial this. We're gonna go again. See, I actually got a lot of chips out of there. A lot more than I was expecting. It's a little tight up in there. I'm not sure. There must be a burr or something on the thread. I'm gonna do another little pass. Bet you that's exactly what it needed. Oh yeah, much better. Okay, threads are done, awesome. Yeah, I could have bought a tap. One that would have done it was like 40 bucks and uh, I'd probably never use it again. So, and then I would have had to wait. That was really the main thing. So I saved 40 bucks and I didn't have to wait. Awesome. I think that's gonna work. All right, obviously the new rod is longer and I've done careful measuring about five times to make sure I don't mess up. I need my rod to be 19 and 1 8 inches long. So I'm gonna need to get through that hardened layer. Now I know a ceramic insert is the way to go. I don't have ceramic inserts. I was not able to find any for a reasonable price. I found a place where I could order a box of them uh, and it was gonna be $100. So I'm gonna see what I can do to get through it without. Uh, I may have to resort to abrasives. So I need it to be 19 and an eighth and then I'm gonna drill at 5 eighths so that that will fit in there. And then I need to kind of bevel it back so that I have room to get my welder down in there and make a new weld. What I have here is an old insert that I touched up on a diamond stone to see if I could just get a little bit of cutting out of it through this hard stuff. Don't know if it'll work. doing surprisingly well. What it did to the tip of that, that thing was a nice point and it is just gone now. So I've got another one that has a point on it that's starting to wear out. You know, one thing I could do is come over here with an angle grinder and just grind it off, but then I'm throwing abrasive all over my lathe. I don't really want to do that. All right, I think I finally got it. That was a fight. There we go. That's the induction hardened layer, and the rest of this is not hardened, so it's much softer. Now, I need to set this thing up so that I can do some welding without destroying my lathe. All right, I got my welding blanket 
every inch of my lathe waves are covered and I am I just got the paint off of that so that's where I'm going to put the ground clamp I'm going to cover the eye up the only thing that's going to be exposed is what I'm welding uh, I got a piece of copper here Well, it's not cutting edge engineering, but uh, it's actually working pretty well. Yeah, a little ugly. Grinder and paint makes me the welder I ain't. All right, got my new seals. As usual, there's been slight modifications to things. So this is the actual seal, the oil pressure seal, and that's the same, it's just a different color. This two-piece thing that I had not seen before, that is a buffer. Um, basically, when there's a pressure spike, this will take some of the strain or pressure off of the actual seal. Um, it acts as a buffer. Uh, the old one was a two-piece buffer, this one's a one-piece. So there's that, there's the wiper, this is the o-ring and backup ring and the piston seal the old one had the the split seal and then an o-ring a round o-ring for preload this one does not have a split seal and has a square one for preload and this one is pretty stiff I may have to heat that one up but we'll see how this goes the wear bands. They didn't have these wear bands, um, but the good news is, and you can still see the part number on my wear bands. They're they're basically like new. All they have to do is hold up against sideways pressure. It's not like it has to not leak. So I'm fine with reusing the old wear, wear bands. So we'll be doing that. So the buffer goes in first, maybe. Hey. Okay, now next is the actual seal. And I have a new tool for that. See how that averts it? Put it down in there. Pop it in. All right, let's see if we can coax this wiper in here. Okay, these guys have a flat side, usually, and a concave side. The concave side goes towards the pressure. No 
Okay, that's a rebuilt gland. Now, how's the piston going to go? We're going to be heating that up. A little hydraulic oil. Amazing what a difference that makes. I'm here I'm going to go ahead and do the other piston. One wear band right back on there. Second wear band. Let's knock out the second gland. I took these old seals in. Cat did not have their seal kits in stock and they were $126 a piece. I took these into the local hydraulic shop that just does all sorts of stuff. Um, they're also the Yanmar dealer. And they gave me both sets for 120. Actually, it was a little less than that. Still seems like a lot for some pieces of plastic and some O-rings, but what are you gonna do? All the seals are in. So this rod cost me $65. Other than that, it's the seals. So 120 bucks basically for all new seals and a new rod on a cylinder. Man, if I hired someone to do that, whew, we're ready to start putting this thing back together. And that is a serious wiper. There it is. So a torque wrench really isn't an option for me with this one. I don't have a wrench that would go this high. Click. That's going to do it. The second cylinder went much the same. So I'm past this port now. I should be able to uh, use the hydraulics to do the rest. All right, now this is gonna tear up my nice new paint job, but oh well, nothing you can do about that. Ah, click.
one moves a little easier than the other side. I think I'm gonna go ahead and get this eye in place. Okay, now the hydraulic oil. The filter housing is right there, so I'm gonna to need to take that out. Looks like there's a drain plug, so I guess I'll drain as much out as I can so that when I take it out of there, I don't make too much of a mess. Um, this sight glass is really fogged up, and that's how you're supposed to check the hydraulic oil. It would be nice if that worked. Looks to me like I'm gonna to have to take that off to clean it. And there, I guess you can see the problem. That thing is totally... Yeah, I'm gonna be able to clean that up. Here, just to show you, you can actually see through that thing now. Nice and clean in there. So there's an O-ring up there, but it looks to be in good shape. It was not leaking. I'm going to leave it alone. Some people might wonder about uh, why I didn't pre-fill that. Well, that's on the return. In most hydraulic systems, your main filter is on the return. You can't get enough suction to get enough oil through because you can only get atmospheric pressure worth of pull when you're on the suction side. On the downstream side of the pump, you have as much pressure as you need to push it through that filter. So you get a lot more flow with a smaller micron filter. There are suction filters on hydraulic systems. My excavator has one, but it's like a probably a 50 micron. It's really there just to keep particles of rust from the tank getting sucked up by the pump. This is the main filter and this is downstream of the pump. So this not being full of oil won't hurt a thing. Once the pump starts running, it will fill this up and then dump it into the tank. So this is 10 weight drivetrain oil is what they called for. And I could only get this from Cat, so. All right, yeah. Now that's gonna drop when I run it because I gotta fill those cylinders, I gotta fill the filter, and we'll add more. So I'm just letting it idle for a little bit to circulate the oil. The filter would be full now, and you can see how much it's dropped.
you know, I get a lot of questions about bleeding hydraulic systems. So a brake system is very different from this. A brake system is kind of a one-way hydraulic system. You've got a line that goes to your caliper, pushes on the brake pads, and if there's any air in there, you're gonna get a big spring and it's not gonna be able to push very hard. This is very different because you're getting a big amount of flow of oil. There's a little bit of oil in the lines, but the vast majority of the oil every time you cycle this thing is in the barrel. So that barrel then gets mixed with the air, and then when you cycle it the other way, it all goes back to the tank, and the air just rises to the top of the tank and comes out of the system. There's a breather on the hydraulic tank. So all you have to do is cycle a cylinder back and forth and all the air will come out. I've had hydraulic mechanics tell me it helps to deadhead at the very end of the stroke. In other words, take it as far as it'll go and then hold it there and let the relief valve take some of the flow at that point. But either way, you really don't need to worry about bleeding these kind of systems so much. They'll, they'll self-bleed. So what have we done on this machine? We changed the fuel filter. We checked for a screen behind the primer pump, which does not seem to be there and I can't find. We changed the engine oil and filter. We replaced the seal in the governor and we fixed a hack job of an alternator. We welded on the exhaust, put a new pipe, and we fixed up the, the top of the stack there, which still needs a little bit of adjustment because you can see it's hanging open. <laughs> we cleaned the air pre-cleaner. We repacked this cylinder and put a new rod on it. We drained the transmission oil and cleaned out that screen underneath there. We did some wiring in the console here to fix the hour meter, got the oil pressure switch working, made sure the breaker worked. We changed the hydraulic oil and the hydraulic oil filter. We cleaned out the sight glass so that we can see that. We changed the bevel gear oil. We changed both final drive oils and we patched a leaky final drive under there and then also put a protection on that one. We drained the fuel tank and fixed the petcock valve for draining it next time. We made this board so the battery would stay in place. We also put some protection on the wires, some wire loom. We tightened up our throttle so that it'll stay in place and off camera I also adjusted this so that it won't go into gear accidentally. We had to make a custom wrench to tighten a fitting under there. We repacked this cylinder. We cleaned out that radiator, power washed the whole thing, changed the air filters, patched the crankcase breather and put a new breather in it. Yeah, and again, a little wiring here. Fixed one of the loose track plates. And I'm probably forgetting something, but that's all I can think of right now. Well, there you go, guys. Well, the hydraulics are fixed and you know I really wish I could say we're ready for action ready to put this thing back in service because like I said I have a job coming up with it and a lot of you guessed it too I'm really looking forward to getting out there and pushing some dirt around with this thing but many of you have made really good comments on additional things that I should do to it and one comment in particular something that I had not considered whatsoever and not doing it very well could have led to the early demise well <laughs> I don't know if you can call it an early demise, but not doing it could have led to the demise of this machine. And uh, man, I hadn't even thought about it one bit, uh, but I'm gonna take care of that before we put it back in service, plus several other things. So we're gonna have one more video of repair on this dozer before we're ready to roll. So look out for that one coming soon. And thanks for watching. We'll see you guys on the next one.